ideas on how, how we could go about doing this. Anyone? Sorry. Um, so is there like a keyword which you need to know in order to solve this? So like you shift every letter and then forwards by letters to make space for this no. keyword. <laughs> Yes, in this case you'd look at the cues, the cues are a big clue, but it's not actually the letters, but the letters of the actual words themselves. Any any other ideas? Uh, well, it's quite simple. Could it be every second letter after a cue? No. Uh, essentially, <laughs> <laughs> essentially all, all we need to do is, uh, there's some letters up here that you can't see very well, but we just take these and we put them in to this table here, vertically. So we fill in the letters and we take them away and then we fill in those ones and you can probably see words forming here and then we fill them in and we end up with the message. And as I said, the key is in the cube because the cube which is a very, it's not a very commonly used letter. So you suspect by the vast number of cues there are, they represent something else. But in this case they represent spaces. So we just take those out because that's the only substitution in this entire cipher, otherwise the letters themselves. Um, this, this phrase here says, the computer would deserve to be called intelligent if it could perceive a human if it was a human. And at the bottom here it says www.metro.co.uk slash Turing. And that's because it was part of the Can You Crack It Challenge this year. Uh, and this was the first, the first one, and that's a link to the second challenge. So you may notice here it says Turing. Now, Alan Turing is known, was known as the father of modern computing, and not for no reason whatsoever. He was um, a code breaker in World War II at Collection Park. He helped uh, crack the Enigma code and the Lorraine cipher. He was a telephone engineer and he developed an electromechanical machine so he could uh, do letter analysis and work out which, what, what the messages were saying. Um, he was recruited to the collection part by solving our complex puzzles in the newspaper and then they'd say, send this off for a prize. And they were really, really difficult. So if you managed to uh, solve them, send them off, they'd know that they were smart as well. So you may have got a prize, but you also got an um, invitation from. GCHQ for the equipment back then to come and work with them. And you may have noticed it was Metro.co.uk. Now, Metro.co.uk is a newspaper in the, uh, in the modern times. And the GCHQ's channel is here, they used the newspaper book website. So, in a way, they're still using newspapers. Unfortunately, it did end up in Turing. Um, he was a homosexual in the 1940s and 50s, and back then it was still illegal. So, he was given the choice between chemical castration and prison. Despite all the great work he did, some of us may not be here to work here. Um, so he, he, he was going to just chemical castration in prison. He chose chemical castration, but he couldn't live with himself, so less than two years later he killed himself. Although it only really came to the attention of the public last year, yeah, when the Queen gave him an official pardon, which I think is a bit sad. But I do appreciate the fact that if any of you have an Apple product in here, an iPhone, an iPod, uh, on the back of it, it has an Apple device out of it. That's a home which is Turing because he killed himself by buying, taking a bite and talking to an apple. So the type of cipher we just looked at is what's known as a transposition cipher. And that literally means the moving position. So we've moved, taken the letters and we've moved them into another position. Uh, they're named after what they look like. So this, for instance, is a rail fence cipher because it takes the shape of a rail fence. And you can quite clearly see that it says, we are discovered to flee at once. But if you have to take the cipher text, you just read it off normally. So we'd end up with this gibberish down here. Uh, the key to the transposition cipher we just uh, solved was the number of letters. Because we had 28 blocks of 5 letters in a one book of 3 letters. And that gives us a total of 143 letters. And if you look at the table, you may have noticed it was 11 by 3 columns. And 11 times 3 is 143. And prime numbers have a massive role to play in coding ciphers, uh, but uh, that, that we'll go into that later. Um, As I will say off the top. Um, have any of you ever opened a web document or an email or a web page and gone to source code and seen something like this? Complete yeah. gibberish. This is what's known as base 64 encoding. And um, it's used to send information over the internet without it getting changed or modified. So it came to prominence in the 90s and the noughties when when the internet became widely available to everyone. So it 
otherwise, otherwise we'd end up with a lot more gibberish. Uh, it's known to play 64 because there's 64 characters in this alphabet. So it's the uppercase letters, the lowercase letters, 0 to 9, and plus and slash. So we use, we use base 64 because in binary, six digit strings only ever add up to six, 0 or 1 digit to 6 digits. So to encode in base 64, what we need to do is we need to take the ASCII character set, which is our standard keyboard, uh, American standard for code info. For the American Standard Code for Information Interchange, and we can translate that into binary values. Now, these binary values are the box of eight, and the internet can't send box of eight, otherwise it gets mixed up and we end up with gibberish. So, we take the basics for to make it into ASCII binary. We then need to split three of these ASCII binary codes, because it's a 24 digit long strip, we need to split it into four six digit strips. And then we need to translate these binary values, these six digit strips, ignoring any zeros before the first one, and so we translate these into decimal values. Now, we take these decimal values, which are always, ever, always only ever going to add up to either zero to the six digit three, which is a six digit log. We take these values and go into decimal values and then translate this into base four after, which has value between zero and six digit three. So if we take the word cipher for an example. So we take the ASCII character binary from here, so we take the, word, the letter C, and we get these binary values here. So this is already in a 24 digit bit strip. So we then split this into six, the four six digit strips per 24, and we end up with this. Um, next we need to convert any of these into decimal values. So we ignore any zeros before the first one, and we convert these into numbers. Now binary works in base 2, so base 2 uh, you count to 1 and then you start again, so you go to the next digit. So we go up to 10 and then we go 11, uh, this would go 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, etc. as you can see in this table. Now this gives us these decimal values here. Now all we need to do is match these with the base 64 like that and we get our own cipher text. Now, the idea of base 64 encoding isn't to hide information as such. That's done by um, another means on the outside of uh, the email interchange or something similar. But it's to prevent it getting changed. Um, quite nicely, in an example, we had 48 digits of binary to use the 6 as a word. And 48 is divisible by 2, 24, 4, 6, etc. But if we were to use a the 5, that's an old word, we get 40 digits of binary, which isn't so nice. So we'd have a 24 digit long strip, a 16 digit long strip for the rest of the letters, but then we'd need to pan out with six extra, uh, eight extra characters on them. So then we'd need to put two zeros before the first one, because that doesn't change the value of the last digit. And then we need to pan it out with a zero, uh, an equal sign, which doesn't actually mean anything basically, or it's just a string of six zeros. So next I'm going to talk about the RSA algorithm. And this is a very, very secure cipher method. This is what we use to do our credit cards, our bank details, our secret service use it. And it relies on the fact that uh, semi-prime level, which is a, a product of two primes, is incredibly and impossibly hard to factorize. So this is, uh, RSA stands for River, Shumia, and Apple, and this is what they looked like when they invented it in 1978. So I'd like to uh, show you how difficult it is to factorize. So if we can, I just want you to shout and ask this. What is seven times nine? So it's very simple. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're, we're going to move on to a bit harder now. So what is... <laughs> Charlie, you're going to train yourself too much. <laughs> what is 23 times 11? 240. No, 240. <laughs> <laughs> Charlie's on fire. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, okay. Now I'll add another digit. So just make it a little bit harder again. What is 317,001? <laughs> 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 Right, so you can see it's fairly, fairly easy for some of us to multiply out two numbers. <laughs> um, and, we, and we get a product. But what if I was to give you this one? Anyone? Mr. House? 
It's more difficult. One times 980 times. Try to I don't know what I mean. So it takes a one petaflop, uh, which is one quadrillion calculations per second supercomputer. It takes about a second to do a factor a 24-digit semi-prime number into two 12-digit primes. So if we double the size of the problem, so we have a 48-digit semi-prime number, how long do you reckon that would take to factorise into its constituent prime factors? Just, just randomly. Yeah, 17 and a half. One hour. Hmm? One hour. Mm, how, how long did you say? Seventeen and a half hours. Um, it takes about a day, so you're quite close. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, so if we double the size of the problem again, so we've gone from a second to a day, so we want a 96 digit semi prime. How long do you reckon that will take? Twelve years. Twelve years? Any answer to Two days. Two days? Is this price in the right week? It would take 6,000 years. <laughs> <laughs> Quite a long time. So from second to day, it takes 6,000 years. How long do you reckon it would take doubling the size that, that again until we get 192? So, how long do you reckon it would take to factorise that? Yes, correct. <laughs> but it would take around 10 to the 20 years, which isn't just longer than the age of the universe, it's longer than the universe will probably ever exist for. Okay, so what, what, what would you think would possibly happen using a problem twice that size? So we go for a 384 juice and we find, like pulling out the big guns here. Uh, how, what do you reckon would happen if you try to get a factor of that? We've got a black hole in the middle of the It would actually defeat the <laughs> um, by defeat the universe, I mean if you took every atom in the universe, in not even just the observable universe, but the entirety of the universe, and turned them into supercomputers using standard computational techniques. So we have infinite number of supercomputers, and we have the moment from the Big Bang until the universe experiences the heat death orbit, or its other ultimate fate. Uh, it would not be able to factorise it. And just to give you an idea of what that number would look like, is something like that, which I find pretty scary because it quite easily fits on the page, and I could quite easily type a couple of extra digits and it'd be much longer. But that, that is a number that would completely defeat the universe. So, that probably gives you an idea of how difficult it is to practice cipher. Now, the RSA algorithm is quite complex because of the prime factors, but otherwise, the maths behind it isn't that difficult. It's a type of public key cryptography where the the product, it's a massively huge semi prime number, is known to the public. Uh, or not necessarily known, but it's not hidden as such. It's not, not protected in any way. There are the two you know, there are the two private keys which you need to encrypt and to decrypt, and those can only be known to the two parties, and that way is completely secure. So to encode in to cipher, to do an RSA cipher, what you need to do is you need to pick two prime numbers, P and Q. And then you need to multiply them together to get the public key n, which is that massive central prime number. Uh, so next we need to find phi of n, and phi of n is worked out by p minus 1 multiplied by q minus 1. Then we need to find e, so that e and phi of n are congruent to 1. And that essentially means that they have the greatest common divisor of 1. And e also needs to be between 1 and phi of n. So, from that, we need to now work out D, so that ED is equal to the 1 mod P of N. And modular arithmetic here, as you might not have come across this function before, modular arithmetic is known, also known as clock arithmetic. So if you have a clock, you go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, you've got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, etc., etc. So you essentially stop at that number and repeat again. And then we label the alphabet accordingly. In this case, we're going to be using only uppercase letters, and we're going to label them A as a zero, 
and a, the, the z is 25, so this will be the use as a space. So, if we now need to use this equation to get a temporary number, which uh, you'll see all that's useful in a second, but we take the first character times the number of characters plus the second character for block sizes of 2. If you want to increase the block size, you need to use a large prime numbers, and you need to use a second equation. So you get the first character times the number of characters squared, plus second character times the number of characters, plus third character, in their numerical forms which you've obtained from up here. So etc, etc, so first character times the number of characters to the power of 3, plus the second character times the number of characters squared, etc. So, for our example, we're going to use quite small prime numbers, otherwise it makes the maths impossible. So we're going to use P is 47 and Q is 59. So, we multiply them together to get N, which is a public key, which is 2, 7, 7, 3. Now we'll use my phi of N, which we do 46 times 58, and that gives us 2668. Now we need to find E, which we can do using E is the phi of that. E and phi of n are to 1, and it just so happens I've picked it to be 17 because it gives me a very nice number for d. So, to find d, we use Euclid's algorithm to find, to work it out, which means the greatest common divisor of these two numbers is, well, it's the greatest common divisor. So we use that, Euclid's algorithm is essentially, you divide one number by another, and the remainder of that is then, is then divided into the previous divisor, and it's it continued on to get a remainder of zero, and that tells us our greatest common divisor. It's not entirely necessary in this case because we're using small numbers, but when you're using massive, massive semi-primes, it's very useful. So here's our alphabet that we've labelled, and we're going to be using block sizes of two, and the word we're going to be encrypting is yes, to keep things very simple. So we split this into two blocks of two, and then we need to work out temp using the formula on the previous page. So we take the numerical values, and the first character times the number of characters, plus the second character gives us 10. And then, so we work that out, and that gives us 512 for YE, and then we work it out for YV, and that gives us 512 and 652. Now, we need to put temp to the power of E, and E stands for encrypt, and that's the private key, so the encrypting party has this private key, and then we mod it by M, and that gives us our encrypted text. Uh, we use D to decrypt, and we'll see that in a second. So we take 512 to the power of 17, which is our little uh, S and our little B, and we put that to the mod 2773, which gives us 1278. So we take 652 to the power of 17, and mod it by 2773, and that gives us 727. So our encrypted text is 7271278, which, if someone came across, probably wouldn't mean much for anyone. To decrypt this, we need to essentially do the inverse, but what we do is we take the cipher text and put it to the power of D and mod it by N to get our second temporary number, and then we do temp over the number of characters, and we take the integer part of the first character, and then, and then, uh, and that's our first character, and then we do uh, this from here, which is temp minus the integer part of the first character times the number of characters gives us our second character for block sizes of two. Looks as three, and obviously the equation is more complex. So we match the numbers up with the characters of the alphabet used, and we've got our messages decrypted. So, what we do here is we take our cipher text, uh, so we take 727 and we put it to the power of the decrypting private key, which is 1572, and then we mod it by 2773, which was 652, which you may recognize from the previous slide. And then we do 652 divided by the number of characters in the alphabet, or our, 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 our alphabet, which is we use 27 characters. And that gives us 24. So we do 652 minus 24 times 27. There should be some brackets here, and that would give us 4. So that's 24 and 4, which you can match the alphabet. And then we take our second part of the encrypted text, and that gives us 1278 to the power of 157 multiplied by 2773, and that gives us 512, which you also recognize from the previous slide. So we do 512 divided by 27, that gives us 18.96296. Well, we're not interested in the decimal point, we just want the integer part of the first value. So we take 18 and we do 512 minus 18 times 27. So our answers are 24, 4, 18, and 26. Now, if we match this to the alphabet we used, we get the letters Y, E, S, and B, and we get the word yes. This was quite a simple cipher, 
It's, it's a simple RSA set alphabet, or using the Caesar shift alphabet, or even encoding it and encoding it in a separate way before you send the message, which is quite often done when we, they use our credit card details. And this is done by computers every day. Um, if you ever take money out of a bank, if you ever in a bank, it's probably used more than like a calculator. It's it's used for everything that we need to keep private in our lives. Um, this does break down a little bit though, because there are things which are known as weak keys, which are numbers that are easier to factorize than others, um, which is the case because um, we've had this cipher has only ever been cracked by a computer in a 768-bit format, which means it's got a short so than a 384 gram number. But that's because it was a weak key, and so the computer could do it easier. Uh, also, computer power is scaling up more and more. Every two years it doubles, essentially. So it makes it easier for computers to crack it. Um, there's also a fact that division algorithms that mathematicians are coming up with is, are getting better and better, and so that makes it easier to factor again. But the real problem with this type of cipher is the advent of quantum computing. Now, I showed you the slide back there where it took 6,000 years to pack the 96 digits over. Um, it takes a quantum computer about a minute to factorize uh, a 24 digit run, which is 60 times slower, admittedly, than a standard computer. However, if you were to use a 48 digit semi number and a quantum computer, it would take about 6 minutes. Uh, and then a 96 would take about half an hour, and a, a, it could quite easily factorize our 324 digit semi prime, which renders this completely uh, useless in a sense. But um, uh, quite a topical thing is the NSA have been rumored to start building quantum quantum computer to crack these subsiders to invade privacy because they're such nice people. Um, so quantum computers are going to be the best of this cipher. However, quantum computers do offer us a new type of cipher um, based on the properties of quantum entanglement. Now quantum entanglement is where two particles are created in a very small space between each other. And the uh, entanglement itself is that the sum of their properties at the point of creation is equal to the sum of their properties forever, no matter how far apart they are. So, if we have a quantum particle, say an electron, um, it has spin, strangeness, charge, etc., etc. So we'll just so it has this property x, and uh, if I have one particle and Matthew over there has another particle. And at the point of creation, both of our particles have a sum of a property of one. So if I measure my particle, I know that it's a half, and therefore I know that the Matthews is also a half. If I measure mine, it's a 0.3 of this property, his would say 0.7, so it always sums to one. You know we've been hacked if I said, oh, mine's 0.3, oh, that's strange, mine's 0.8, that doesn't add up to one. So that's how you know it's instead. And if there's a third party um, trying to read this particle, then they observe it and it would change its state, so it wouldn't be the initial message that people have been trying to send. So it's supposedly uncracking. However, um, mathematicians, physicists, etc., need to think one step ahead. So in in a, in a case there is a advent of hyper quantum computing, say, and that offers us a way to crack these quantum uh, entangled crypt. Uh, how? What do we do then? Um, there's supposed to be two options. Uh, either this hyper quantum computing will give us a new method that's even more secure than the quantum computing before. As computing gave us the RSA cipher, and quantum computing will take, that, take the security of that away. Hyper quantum computing will take the uh, quantum cipher away, and it will give us this hyper quantum cipher in, in exchange, so it will still be unhackable. Or, uh, time travel. Theoretically, because you really hate just to move up on that. Um, time travel. In Einstein's uh, equations for general relativity, time travel is allowed. Uh, we, we haven't proved it, we haven't proved it wrong, though, which is the real, the real problem here. So, theoretically, the safest way to send a message is to send it before we've even sent it. So that if they receive it before you've sent it by a second or so, it won't violate the rules of physics, but it will still get there. So, if we send a message, into the past. No one can intercept it because no one will be there to intercept it. And it will be completely secure. Uh, there's not been a lot of research into this, and I doubt that will be for some time. But if it, it does ever happen, I guess we'll find out in the past. 
And um, that's that's all. Uh, take questions. Now.